Hi, this is Ellie Fishman, and welcome to part two on hematuria. And at the end of the last talk, I was speaking about infection and pyelonephritis, and most patients, obviously, who have renal infection don't need imaging. They get ultrasound sometimes, but usually you just treat infection. Uh, where CT comes in particularly is often patients with FUOs, and you didn't know there was renal infection, and so it's an incidental finding. Or you're looking for a source of fever, and it's one of the possibilities. Or it's a patient with known pylo and is not responding to patient's antibiotics, and so then you worry about complications like abscesses. Abscesses are kind of interesting. Focal low density masses, remember we used to call lobar nephronia. They're often cystic with thickened walls, and I will make the point that at times, abscesses can simulate necrotic tumors, can look identical. You see stranding in the peri and pararenal space through gerotus fascia. Certain infections can have extensive perinephric extension. Abscesses typically are solitary, but they can be multiple. And usually they're unilateral, but not always. Polynephritis is not uncommonly going to be bilateral. This patient actually had a funny history. It wasn't a great history. You look at this, and I told you this is a cystic renal mass that's a carcinoma. You would say yes. But there's perirenal stranding by the psoas muscle that looks like induration of the psoas muscle. There's an enhancing rim, and it's necrotic. But it's that perirenal involvement and the involvement of the psoas that I think are most helpful. And yes, I could make a case for a tumor, but when you looked into it, the patient was febrile. Here's the, uh, the um, excretory phase. Again, the, the rim, this was an abscess. Another example, very similar appearance. Non-contrast, what's going on in the left kidney? Is that a complex cyst? Is it a tumor? What is it? With contrast, you can see it's a mass with septations and thickened wall. Could this be a cystic renal cell carcinoma like a papillary? You surely need to think about that. There's some stranding around the kidney. The kidney's enlarged. Here it is on the excretory phase. This was an abscess. So sometimes you need to say, I wonder if this patient has infection. Sometimes it's a little bit tricky. And if you don't have a history of fever or flank pain, you can go straight down the tubes and go right to a tumor. Tumor, necrotic is not uncommon. Abscess is less common, in fact. But this is a beautiful example of an abscess. Now we have certain unique infections in the kidney. Large kidney, often no or poor function. Large staghorn calculus. Look at this example, large dilated calyces, right kidney, central staghorn calculus. This patient has some functioning right kidney, but it's poorly functioning. Just compare it to the left kidney. And you can see the kidney's large. You can see the calyces, both the staghorn calculus and other calculi. The calyces all look ballooned out. And here it is on uh, MIP imaging. And this is a unique entity that we see occasionally, which is xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis. It's one of the few X words. It's a chronic destructive granulomatous process which results from a typical incomplete immune response to a subacute bacterial infection. We often see this in patients who are poorly treated. They're in nursing homes. They're old patients. They don't complain. That's how we pick it up at times. We used to talk about diabetes, but diabetes is under 10% of cases, more common in females, more common in middle to older age patients. Pyuria, positive cultures, and hematuria are all presentations. When you look at the imaging, the large staghorn calculus century is, centrally is most common. There's an extensive inflammatory process with dilated calyces, often no renal function. It usually involves the entire kidney. It's usually unilateral, but at times, as in the last case, can be more focal and involve only a portion of the kidney. And involvement of the perirenal space is most common, and I'll show you examples. One of the first articles I wrote way back when was on XGP. In the old days, the way XGP was detected, you would have flank pain, they palpated something, posterior paraspinal region, and they would operate. And what they actually found was an abscess in the patient's psoas muscle, which was due to underlying renal infection. So you can see now we get scans, be it CT or ultrasound, much more frequently. So things like XGP are rare to occur, and that's why I mentioned nursing home patients, they don't get great medical care, they're often debilitated, and people aren't paying quite as much attention. But it's a chronic process. Here's another example. Big kidney, staghorn calculi, no cortex left, minimal function, 
And this is a case where the patient almost has bilateral XGP. That would be extremely, extremely unusual, but it's on the way there. Look at the extent of calcifications. You can see it on the MIP imaging particularly nicely. This is a great example of where the patient has XGP involving the upper two-thirds of the right kidney. The lower portion of the right kidney actually has normal renal function. There's also inflammation in the left kidney, and you can see it here, the perfusion changes when we do cinematic rendering, the changes in the upper to lower pole of the right kidney, some of the changes in the left kidney, the caliectasis, and the like. So it's a very unusual process, but something to consider. Staghorn calculus, poor or no function, big kidney, dilated calyces. You gotta be thinking about XGP, particularly in a patient coming from a nursing home or a patient who's debilitated. Beautiful cinematic renderings. Another example, here it is a large kidney, dilated calyces, calcifications, but you can see the involvement of the pararenal space extending to the paraspinal muscles. That is just classic. And so you need to drain that. So the patient's presentation was a palpable mass and pain posteriorly. So this is my point about infection going to perirenal and pararenal and then going through into the paraspinal muscles. Just a beautiful example. The kidney has minimal, minimal function, but the kidney is basically going to get a nephrectomy and you're going to have to drain that abscess in the paraspinal muscles. Another example, here's another case. Large right kidney, poor function, dilated calyces, not the calcifications of the other kidney, but look how large it is and look at the involvement of the pararenal space and the paraspinal muscle region. Large abscess, which will need to be drained. Here's a few more images of that. That's classic presentation of xanthogranulomas polynephritis. Here's the same case in coronal view, and there is some function in that kidney. Now, it's interesting, we have a few of these really um, well-defined things in the kidney in terms of infection. XGP is one, and the other one is emphyseminous polynephritis. That's the patient who's a diabetic. Again, it's often a debilitated patient. Again, think nursing home. It's a life-threatening, necrotizing infection of the kidneys characterized by gas formation within and surrounding the kidney. 90% of the patients have poorly or uncontrolled diabetes, and the patients who aren't diabetic are usually immunosuppressed. Most commonly, it's E. coli, but Klebsiella and Proteus are right up there. When you're looking for things like emphyseminous polynephritis, CT is the study of choice. I've seen ultrasound missed, ultrasound missed the diagnosis because CT, it's the air. Ultrasound, you can think it's artifact of reflected air. We see parenchymal enlargement typically. We see destruction of the parenchyma, often with air with of varying amounts. We see fluid in and possibly around the kidney. We see air fluid levels with necrosis, and we see tissue necrosis. Dramatic examples. Fortunately, we don't see this diagnosis very often. Look at the left kidney. The bottom half is destroyed. There's no viable cortex there. Look at the extent of the involvement. You're looking at the destruction of the patient's left kidney. Or in this example, also in the left kidney, marked destruction of the left kidney. There's some minimal enhancement, but no true normal parenchyma. Or in this case, we see this big dilated uh, necrotic left kidney with the air in the peri and pararenal spaces. You can see that. Occasionally, you can see air in the kidney and the calyces from a retrograde study or potentially from a, a procedure. But here, it's the calyces and the kidneys, and you see the destruction and the inflammation. That's emphyseminous polynephritis. Now, as we go from inflammatory to, a, to vascular, things we think about are infarction. Renal infarction can be due to many things. We typically think about thromboembolism. Thrombus in the left side of the heart, aneurysm of the aorta renal arteries, atherosclerosis, SBE, transcatheter embolization or other vascular procedures, and the section of the aorta or renal artery. We also talk about things like vasculitis, polyuritis nodosa, lupus, and drug-induced vasculitis come to mind. We talk about trauma, whether it's avulsion of the renal artery or penetrating vascular injury or occlusion of the renal artery. We talk about paraneoplastic syndromes or hypercoagulability states or venous occlusion all become very, very important. So what do we know about renal infarction? Segmental or global? Segmental is more common. 
can be isolated or part of multi-system disease, can have infarcts in the kidney and the liver and the spleen, for example. Acute and chronic renal infarction do occur, and symptoms may range from acute flank pain to FUO to simply hematuria. Now, what do we look at? What do we see? Well, with renal infarction, again, I mentioned focal versus global. It may be impossible to see on the non-contrast scans unless the kidney is enlarged and then you know there's something going on, but you cannot tell infection. At times, it's difficult to pick up or distinguish infection from infarction, particularly early. You look at the vessels carefully, looking for vessel occlusion. It can be, unilater it can be bilateral, but usually it's unilateral. We talk about cortical rim sign, which is due to global infarction and capsular vessel enhancement. And we talk about chronic renal infarction may be seen as a small kidney, often with atrophy and calcification. So let's look at this example. What you see, first of all, is the entire right kidney does not have the cortical medullary differentiation you see in the left, but also the anterior half has decreased attenuation. You look at it a little bit more closely, you see it a little bit better, but then when you look and you go through the artery, you see clot in the patient's right renal artery. The classic infarct, and you see the thrombus beautifully seen on those images. And even I'll give you the fantastic arrow to show it to you. Another example, patient, flank pain. Look at the left kidney, decreased attenuation. That's not pilo. There's such decreased attenuation. There's no flow. That's an embolic phenomenon with a renal infarct. And you can see initially the kidney can be large, then it begins to get smaller. You can see here, again, the renal artery clot. And so it's very important to look carefully at the recons, coronal, sagittals, obliques, to really look at the vessels and try to find the cause. And so you can see with MIP very nicely, the infarct really well defined the normal enhancing kidney from the areas of decreased enhancement. And then you look carefully, you look at the aorta, you look at the heart. And when you look at the heart, this patient had two findings, one an aberrant origin of the right coronary, malignant configuration, and then a filling defect in the atrial appendage. It was likely the atrial appendage filling defect was, was giving the patient the embolic phenomena. Another example, here's a great case of a nice large infarction of the right kidney. You can see when you look at the volume rendering and the MIP, the attenuation of the arteries, the branching, the cutoff due to infarction and embolization. You see it very nicely on the MIP imaging, really nicely shown, though the main renal artery is well-defined. And then here it is again, again wedge-shaped. Again, you think about polynephritis, but there's no stranding. And just the shape and the sharpness, you gotta think vascular, and that's true in the kidney, and the liver, and the spleen. And then here it is on the cinematic, where you have almost that cutoff of the vessels. You can see the decreased attenuation, the decreased enhancement, just a beautiful example of infarction. Another example, look at the left kidney. Look at the patient as aortic dissection, and now you see the lack of function of the lower half of the right kidney. You see beautiful example of that. And dissection is one of the things, the sections could track into the renal artery and occlude it, also, once you get surgery, this patient had a renal, had an abdominal aortic aneurysm, had a repair, you see the right renal artery, you don't see the left, the patient has flank pain, and now you see the left kidney, which is infarcted. Global infarction, minimal capsular enhancement, this patient needs a nephrectomy, okay? Very, very straightforward. And then if you ask the question, why when you have infarction do you have rim enhancement, isn't the kidney viable? No, it's capsular vessels, so you see it, because capsular vessels enhance, but the rest of the kidney is not enhancing. That's a picture of global infarction, beautifully shown on the coronal views. Now, renal infarction can be due to a number of things. It can be due to trauma. It can be due to surgery, most common adrenal surgery. And here's an example of a resection of a neuroblastoma with infarction of the patient's left kidney. You can see the stranding by the left kidney and there is no function. Beautiful example of global infarction. If you cut the renal artery, we know this from trauma, you have about five or six hours to repair it to make the kidney viable. This was a couple days out, and so there's no hope. All the patient can do is get a nephrectomy. So infarcted left kidney, nicely shown. Here it is again on some additional images. And here it is on the cinematic rendering. And I like the cinematic. We're doing a lot of work looking at flow, and you can see the lack of flow, the lack of enhancement. It's just beautiful in the patient's left kidney. 
Now, in terms of vascular stuff, we also think about things like renal vein thrombosis. Now, we typically think about the renal vein when we have a tumor and we want to know about renal vein involvement and then IVC extension. That's very common. But renal vein involvement can be due to a number of things, including things like nephrotic syndrome and the like. So let's do this. I want to make this into a three-part, and I need to stop here to make it exactly three perfectly proportioned lectures. So I'll be back in five and see you then. Bye. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, 